a lot of mental work. You have to you have to stop every day. Like even as a even as a, as a teacher, it's difficult. So for me, I, I'm incredibly introverted. Um, you'd never know it probably from being up here. But if any of you ever run into me somewhere outside of school, I'm not going to be out there just you know flailing my arms and screaming that, that God is dead or something like that. I'm very quiet, very very kind of to myself. But that wouldn't be effective as a teacher. If I came in here and just stared at the floor and talked. I've had a, I've had professors like this, by the way, that genuinely in front of a lecture hall, they stand there and they lecture like this while staring down at the ground. Keep that in mind when you're paying a whole bunch of money for, for classes in universities. But what you have to do once in a while, especially if you're this person, is you have to look up and you have to see faces. And I notice that when I look at faces, a lot of times faces look at me and then faces turn away. Sometimes faces look at me, then they get angry. Sometimes faces just take it as part of like the interaction, but you have to stop and genuinely look up. And it's hard for me to do, but you have to do it because life changes, things change. You see different things on people. And all of that can kind of, again, feed into this life. I guess the, the best way to, to explain it is um, it takes a deep understanding that to view life in a stereotyped way is to deprive yourself of all these life experiences. So have you ever seen like a little kid who goes to the beach and it's like their first time going to the beach, maybe, and they're like walking out there, they like like a little baby gorilla. You know, they have that, that gorilla walk, and then they look back to see if their parents are watching. And maybe, of course, the dad's up there just like, the mom's like, you know, kind of a little bit concerned, you know, and then he like, but then he just just checks to make sure that they're still there, and that's because the parents are the center of his explorative world. To him, that's the whole world. Where my parents are, that's where the safety is. So when that kid starts to walk away from the parents. That kid is sending a very important message, which is, I feel secure with that, but also feel secure with taking risks. When you have children who stay super close to the parents, those are children who aren't yet comfortable taking risks. And they probably learn that because they maybe have a parent who's always hovering over. Some of you, I'm sure, um, have been in families before where you've seen this, like at a park, and you have like a, I don't know, may have like a big family and you have like big parties at the park sometimes. And then you see these little kids who are comfortable with being with other little kids and like running off away from the parents. And the parents are also secure enough to not be like, oh, where are they going? What's going on? You know? And so they, the kids will, look, will pick up that kind of, ener uh, of energy. So when you see that little kid who's walking out there, he's like looking back at his parents, and he's walking towards the water. The parents are close enough that if the kid decides to go for a dive, they can go retrieve him. But they're also giving that kid the space, the opportunity to develop and make those kinds of mistakes. I mean, if that sounds familiar for many of you, any of your teachers, as the semester goes on, you'll understand this class a little bit more. This is one of the reasons I don't stand above you when you guys are working, like, come on, hey, get your work done. Hey, stop that right now, do this. Because you're, you're not learning how to, 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 to distance that gap between you and your teacher. If the teachers are always hovering above you, then you think that that's what school is. You think that that's more importantly what education is. Once you walk out of here, and next June, or June, yeah, next June, how much you learn is going to be entirely on you. And if the only way you've ever been able to learn is by having someone hover above you and tell you to do this, then that's, and, and then once that's gone, well, then you've kind of lost that, that motivation for, for learning. But if you learn how to do it when you distance those gaps, then you'll be better off. The same is true with a little kid taking risks. The more that that little kid can, can build those gaps between their parents and still feel secure, the more exploratory they're going to be. And then the kid walks out there he steps in the ocean for the first time, and it doesn't matter what the temperature is like. It's cold, right? Even if that water was 150 degrees, it's still cold. He's going to step in and go, whoa, and back up, and then like check, he's like laugh, and then everybody's going to laugh, and so he laughs, and then he starts to walk out there again. And then after a little while, the kid gets really comfortable in the water. In fact, maybe even too comfortable. That's when the parents kind of have to come in and go, hey, you know, you can't swim over there, not that far out. But why is it that the kid is so excited about being at the beach? Because the kid can't help. The kid doesn't have the memories yet to be able to fill in the gaps of his imagination. He has to actually experience the things as they are. And this is why the first time at the beach is exciting, second time, a little bit, third time, less so, and then things start to travel out. Why? Because as you get older, all beaches are the same. All roses are the same. And then we get really bad on it. We say, all fill in the gap are the same. I remember a good friend of mine, she got married and um, she, she, she was dating this guy, he was from Egypt. All I knew from him was that he was the Egyptian. She never t she's like one of my best friends. She, I, never, I never learned the guy's name. She just called him the Egyptian. 
And so when she first told me that she was dating the Egyptian, she goes, what are Egyptian men like? I'm like, oh my God, you don't know what Egyptian men are like? She's like, no, what are they like? I said, this is gonna shock you. They're like everybody else. They're different individually. <laughs> And she's like, oh my God, but, but like generally, what the, and she really saw the world that she saw people through, through generalizations and through stereotypes. And I'm saying this, and I understand that I'm saying this to people who, I'm sure several of you probably see the world that way too. All fill in the blank of any race, ethnicity, religion, culture, or whatever, are like this. And all that that means is you haven't really experienced many of them. Okay? You're, you're seeing the world the exact same way as you're seeing the bush. You're filling it in with this generalization because you haven't experienced the thing itself. And so there's value there, by the way. Just like if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your mind had to update that bush every time you walked past it, and you had to update the pinata every time you pass it, and you had to update this classroom, by the way, your brain would have time for nothing else. There's only so much bandwidth. And at some point, some of you guys are going to come in and you're going to realize that every time you guys walk out of here at the end of the day, I go and I change five things in the room. Every day it's five things. Which five things? So they're always different. They're always different. Sometimes I'll change that thing up there. Sometimes I'll move the Christmas tree someplace else. Sometimes I'll change some of the papers that are up on the wall. Every day I change five things because when you walk into a room, your, your unconscious is going to recognize that something's a little bit different. Maybe you won't even know what it is, but it helps with, with brain function if you, see, if, you, if you acknowledge the differences. But if, you, if every day you have to update your, your mind, so every minute, every second of every minute, you have to update your mind, it becomes overwhelming. So there's some, there's some utility, there's some, benefic there's some benefit to just seeing things in a stereotyped way. So to answer your question from like an hour ago, how is it that you, need, that you, that you, that you can st stop doing that? That's what you have to do, you have to stop. You have to stop and you have to look at it and go, this is different. But you also are gonna come to an understanding at that point that life is incredibly short. No matter how long it is, life is still too short. And so that means that you have to pick and choose the things that you're going to become well acquainted with. What are the things that are worth studying? What are the things that are worth looking at? You know, is it art? Who knows? Is it people? Who knows? Is it video games? Who knows? Whatever it is for you, but just ensure that whatever it is that you're doing, that it's bringing you the, the highest possible level of passions and excitement for your, for your minutes, because that's what your life is made up of, those minutes. And the more time that you spend on this, the less time that you have to spend on that. It's a zero-sum thing. And so you have to figure out in your life what's important to you, what you want to know more about. Is it a person? Is it people? Is it a subject? You know? It's like I see the way you're dressed today. And I was standing, it was standing out to me because I was thinking, like, I wanted to ask you next time you come in here if anyone gives you any shit over it. Because we used to have a, you know, we had the spirit weeks, we used to have a gender bender one. And then someone came along and was clutching their pearls and was explaining, well, no, this is, we can't do this anymore because we have trans students and this is insulting, you know, their identity. And so they said, we can't do that anymore. It's like, well, we have all kinds of spirit weeks that we used to do. I can't wait until somebody gives a bunch of shit over today because soccer moms and, and barbecue dads, you know, somebody I, I point out, I go, isn't that just like dressing up like white people? I go, We'll wait till someone gets offended by it, and then once someone gets offended by it, we'll have one more spirit thing that we can't do. But the gender bender one was so incredibly interesting because you would see girls who'd come in, and they would be dressed like guys. And and how do they dress? They dressed as stereotypes of guys. They dressed as here's what I think guys look like. I mean, and they have these girls come in, they'd be like you know wearing like white beaters, uh, sorry, tank tops, and then they'd have like you know, and they come and go, what's up, Scam? <laughs> Like, I'm, I'm thinking, like, I haven't had any dude in here come here and go, sup, scam, mm. you know? But this is how they see it. Now, it's even better when you see the guys dress up as girls. First off, you got to understand, there's something going on down there. If you, if you come in and you're wearing a skirt and thigh highs and heels, and you get all made up for a, oh, it's just a spirit day. I look at you and I go, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. We're checking in on you in a few years and see which direction this goes in. But that's what you see. You, you see that guys will dress up as girls and they'll dress up as the stereotype. They'll, in other words, what, that, that's how they view girls. And this is how, they view, how girls view guys. And you can see how, how we see each other you know, in these different ways. And that's a really neat education that you can get. How is it that people see you? It's like when you guys walked out of here, um, like I told you before, I presume that 
whenever I'm talking up here that there's no more than three or four of you who are paying attention to me at any given moment. You can go through the motions, because if you nod, I won't call on you. <laughs> you can squint, because then that makes me think you're paying attention. But I don't know that anybody actually is. I kind of presume that once you walk out of here, that's kind of it. That you just kind of, you know, maybe it's entertaining for a few minutes and you forget about it. But I wonder when you're out there, if you do an impression, if anyone were to do an impression of me, what that would look like. You know, I'm always wondering, because I'll have some students who'll say, you told us that this was going to be due on Thursday or whatever. I'll say, no, I didn't. And then, then the student will go, yeah, you did. You're like, yeah, because you guys are yelling, this is due on Thursday. I'm like, it's a terrible impression of me, I think. But why does a person sound like that? Because they're, 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 it's not just a, a stereotype of you, it's a, it's a hyperbolization of you. It's an exaggeration of you. But that's how they see me. Someone who talks like that, <laughs> they see me as being ridiculous. And that's a nice thing to know, because that can keep you humble if you realize that everyone sees you as ridiculous. You know, <laughs> maybe you might want to do something about that. So that if you all, if you guys all came in and were like, "Let's see your impression of Scanlon," you know, and I'd be like, "Okay, maybe I'm ridiculous." <laughs> but it's good to know because then you understand. Then, but it's good for me to know because now I understand what I'm dealing with. This is how I'm seen. If you're a girl and you see guys who dress this way now, then you go, "That like, it's good to know." It's got that, the way he's dressed has nothing to do with women. It has to do with how he perceives women. When you see girls dressed this way, same thing. Maybe it's got nothing to do with, with men. It's got something to do with how we perceive men. And, it's, and, and by the way, it's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just a thing. It's information that's good to know. You know it's good to know this stuff. So that answers your question from an hour ago. <laughs> how do you, you, have to, you, you genuinely have to stop and, and, and look at it and ask yourself if these things are true. You know? In some places, it's very difficult. I grew up in Los Angeles. It's very difficult to have stereotypes of people when you grow up in Los Angeles because we're so culturally and ethnically mixed up. You know, it's hard to, to hate a bunch of people because you know them. You, know, you interact with them. The less we interact with other people, we always have exaggerated ideas of things that we don't know. And so we fill them like, like the closet. We fill them what's in the closet with our imaginations. So sometimes you have, you, you have to go and actually investigate it and fill it in with your logic and your reasoning, not with your imagination. I'm sorry, I don't want to dissuade you from asking questions in the future if you're doing a 45 minute thing, but I'll try to keep them limited. <laughs> That's something I imagine I would do. Just, it just goes on. Then. All right, questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques, others. If anyone, any, anyone brave enough to ask another 45 minute question? Yes. Why did you choose the site of Boston? Um, that's a good question. Others? <laughs>